All right, Ryan, we are live. Uh, we already have our first comment here from the Epic Hamster. Hey, Jason, on the road to recovery. Uh, yeah, actually, I was sick last week. Weird thing with all of those tests. I was not actually able to determine what I had. Not that it's really all that important. I was sick, stayed isolated for, for you know a week or so. Yeah. I was able to train this week, get some exercise. That was good. Um, we have a topic planned for today. Uh, which is, you know, three reasons not to invest. We are going to discuss all the reasons why you might not want to invest today or you might want to invest. Um, but this top, this topic also is going to be influenced by current events. Facts. We, guys, we can't uh, ignore the facts here that the U the Russian invasion of Ukraine is going to affect how you're investing. Uh, the sanctions are going to affect the economy both negatively and positively, that's one of the things I'd love to talk about. I have fairly deep familiarity with the chemical and oil industry, having been an investor in it for 25 mm -hmm. years or so. And uh, we can talk about how this actually in the long run is going to benefit us. But let's get on the road here towards talking about a couple of reasons not to invest. Ryan, I know you've been thinking about this for a while. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pick apart all the reasons and excuses that our clients have given us over the years not to resist and are not to uh, invest rather. And it's going to get a little bit more humorous towards the end. All right. I hope so. I need, I, I hope that it's humorous because, you know, after the beating we've had over the last two months and the gray hairs that are coming out, I need a little <laughs> bit, I need a little bit of humor in my life. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. But um, so this, this topic is a little bit odd for me because uh, I am always, I'm typically of the uh, the thinking that, you know, it's always a good time to start investing, right? It's always a good time. You right. ride the waves, you know, you don't market time, you pick the cycle, you you invest, you diversify. So you do all those things right. And then you have something back to back that has, you know, hasn't happened, you know, in a long time, or at least now it, this, this uh, war in the Middle East. So when you're looking at that, you're like, okay, all of these things are being thrown in the pot. And is, is it still a good time to invest? And normally I would say, yeah, absolutely. Everything's, you know, 15% off. Why wouldn't you? It makes total sense. But right. every, every time as an advisor, you, you have to take a step back and say, okay, is this different? Is it, is it different? Why, what can we do? What did we do last time? And you kind of go that route. And so like the first reason that you wouldn't invest, I guess right now, if you're, if you're being thinking critically as an advisor or as an investor um, is what your time horizon is for using the money. Right. Yeah, if, that's, if it, that's a good idea. If yeah. it's at this point, typically I say it shouldn't, you know, you look at a, a rule of uh, a rule of thumb as 18 months or less. If you need that money, then it most likely shouldn't be invested. But I think it, during these times, you could probably even shorten that window to if you need that money in the neck or sorry, lengthen that window. If you need that money 24 to, to 24 months to 18 months from now, then most likely it's probably not a good idea to invest. Right. Okay. Yeah. My, my time horizon on that has always been quite a bit longer, even speaking with clients, like, I'm like, if you don't, if you need this money in the next five years, it should probably remain fairly liquid rather right. than being invested in something like stocks. Uh, you, you cannot guarantee that a stock that you buy today, no matter how good it is, is going to be higher five years from now. You just right. can't do that. 18 months to me seems pretty short, uh, but other mm -hmm. people have different philosophies. I understand that. Um, the thing that I, I don't like to encourage on this uh, on on this outlet here is short term trading, because right. you and I both know that short term traders. Uh, so people lie all the time about how much money they make short term trading, but numbers don't lie. You and I have mm -hmm. both seen the 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 statistics behind all of uh, you know you know Fidelity's research they've all done. Short term traders lose money over time. Almost one hundred percent of them do. Um, so having a time horizon that's appropriate for the type of investment you want to make, I think it's super, super important. Right. I do and to, to, to piggyback on that, Jason, is that, you know, the 18 to 24 months, it is short. And so if you need that money, like you said, underneath five years, then it's not going to be invested aggressively. It just right. allows the, the, um, you to dial up the risk factor. If it's two years, then maybe you invest it conservatively. If it's invest, if it's five years, then maybe you can dial that up to moderate and so on far down the line based on, you know, or, 30 years for retirement, then you can be as, you know, on the, on the high end of risk scale. But uh, yeah, when you're, when you're looking at all of the reasons not to invest, I mean, fear of the unknown when you're uh, Anthony Walker, I said, why, why does the market never do what we think it will do? Right. And the answer is uh, we have no clue. <laughs> and so when you're always, when you're always looking at, when you're always looking at 
what the market should do or all the factors, all the, uh, you know, all the fundamental factors out there that we see that point to what us, you know, having a positive year and then the market tanks is just like, well, that's a kick, you know, that's a kick down below. And you're like, well, maybe I'm not as good at this as I thought I was. Yeah, I, actually, I did a video on that recently talking about the chances of recession. And then I pointed out headlines every year going back to 2014, where, you know, the experts were saying, oh, we're going to have a recession this year. Mm -hmm. And it turned out not to be the case every single time. And it's it's not just that I'm making fun of experts. Even the experts know that uh, this is not an exact science. Humans are really, really bad at predicting the future. No one can predict the future of financial markets right. uh, over the short term. Over the long term, predictions are a little bit better. Uh, but over the short term, they're really, really bad. So I think that especially when you when you when you talk about instability or short time horizon, paying attention to what other people are saying about what the market's going to do is probably the wrong thing to do. Like how many people last year were like, now's a great time to invest, mm -hmm. right? It is a great time to invest. It was a great time to invest. If your time horizon was five, seven, 10 years, right. if your time horizon was 12 months, it was a terrible time to invest. Um, I had to talk one of my business partners right before last year. I had to talk one of my business partners right before we made an investment in, in a new business. He wanted to put it all into cryptocurrency right? Right before that happened, ride it up and say, we'll have 40% more in three months. There's oh, no yeah. guarantee that. Actually, it was, he, it was, it would have been exactly the wrong time. Exactly the wrong wow. time. Wow. So, well, he would have lost 30 or 40%. Hopefully you sidestep that, but I mean, when he did, he did. So barely. when, so when you, when you talked a few seconds ago about like, you know, when everyone's telling you to invest and you're getting that from all sides, whether, you know, now it's so much more prevalent because you have, the TikToks, you have yep. the Instagram and where an entirely new uh, class of investor is coming out, the 22 year olds that have, you know, an extra thousand dollars and they're throwing money at whoever influencer is telling them to, or whatever cryptocurrency is being pushed at the moment. Um, and then you as a, trying to be a, as rational investor as possible, you're hearing all of that and you're seeing that run up on the meme coins from, from AMC. Uh, to um, Shiba, you know, you're just you're inundated with all this stuff. The more, it's a great time, get in. You're gonna miss out, and they they trigger that fear, that that FOMO in you, and you're just it's you're human. You're human. It's a human human nature to try not to miss out, and so you got to delineate and, or be able to segregate what information you're getting, and then see where you go. So when you look at everyone selling you to invest, I always try to find someone who disagrees with that. I try to find two or three people on the fence and then see where I go. Do I lean this way? Do I lean that way? Um, that's how I do it. But, you know, it's hard to not to get to, to get caught up in the people telling you this is the best time to invest. And it is. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those. I'm one of those people. You know, I'm, I'm my investment horizons long term. Most of my clients are long term. So it's, hey, how much can you put it? Let's put more money into the market. Let's put money into the market. So um, it's tough to get out of those habits, too, at the same time. Right. You know, and if if. You're right now really, and, and I can't stress this enough, uh, as much as I like to buy individual stocks and I like to um, you know, sell call ups on those for income, um, for the most part right now, I'm taking a more diversified approach uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to that, largely, largely because of uncertainty. The more diversified you are, the more of that uncertainty you reduce. And um, I see you smiling there. You want to jump in there well, and say something? I just I, I heard you say diversify, yes. and uh, and I'm like, wow, that's Jason. So I was like, did he unwind his Tesla position or no? Uh, I, I, dude, I can't without paying so much in taxes. So I was just, um, when you said but, diversify, I was like, oh my gosh, is Jason is he getting no, rid of individual? No, uh, stocks I can't get rid of that? Tesla. I, I literally can't get rid of Tesla without without i don't want to pay uncle sam i don't like taxes yeah. um it's but avoidable, and, right and but but honestly like buying and holding and not doing anything with tesla with tesla ha, is what has made my wealth over this long period of time yeah. um and also selling covered calls on that position and using that income to diversify is the other thing but right now i mean i'm buying a few different stocks right now uh that are on sale and that are that i think are really forward looking like five ten year investments but mm -hmm. the rest of what I'm getting right now in terms of income, and that has been reduced because of the economy and everyone's uh, hurting a little bit right now. Yeah. Um, that is going to um, into a more diversified approach. I think okay. I'm, I'm buying, uh, you know, diversified ETFs at this point. And I see that as a reduction in um, 
risk concentration, not a reduction in overall risk. My portfolio is still 100% stocks, right? Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with risk. I have an appetite for risk. The market's down for 18 months. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I can bear it. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people can't bear that psychologically. And also financially, that's the reason, another reason yeah. why you shouldn't invest at this point is if you can't take, if you one, if you can't take it emotionally and two, if you can't take it financially, if you don't yeah. have that emergency fund, or I know you're big on having like a three-year emergency fund, which is- yeah. And I realize that's not that reasonable for everyone. Yeah, it's not reasonable yeah. well, for most most people, Jason, but most uh, people aren't as paranoid as I am. <laughs> that's also that is a hundred percent true. That's true. That hundred percent true. But uh, if you if you can't stomach it financially, like if you're if you're taking uh, money out of your bank that is your emergency fund and putting in the investment that, in an investment account because it's at you know fourteen or fifteen percent down, that's definitely not something that anyone uh, prudent investor would advise or prudent advisor would advise. Um, yeah. So financially, you have to be in the in the play in your risk factor where you're not putting your future or your present in jeopardy if the market drops 10 percent 15 percent 20 percent you can't yeah. do that that is that is an absolutely do not invest i get people all the time friends of mine they're like hey look i've got um you know can i start putting five five hundred two thousand dollars a month away uh and you know have you manage it and i was like okay for you know what let me tell me about your situation cash position at this point and they're like oh i have like two thousand dollars in my bank i was like absolutely not you should not be doing any of those yeah. things um absolutely not so uh that is another reason why you absolutely should not uh, invest is if you don't have if you're not set up for it to suffer losses financially um over a short term you absolutely not don't do it okay so i've already gotten the uh the the thing that, i mean the, the question right now or the statement right now that I don't want to invest because the war in Ukraine is going to crash the economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something that I find to be, oh, number one, we could simply be going through an economic cycle where we have a contraction in the economy. We have a couple of quarters of reduction in GDP, mm -hmm. which lasts six to nine months. And then we recover after that. That's entirely normal. And that happens you know, every once in a while. And it unwinds uh, assets. It uh, unwinds uh, bubbles. It hurts people. People go through unemployment. But mm -hmm. this is a perfectly natural feature of capitalism. Um, and, I, and I think that that uh, I think the chances of that were fairly low a month ago. They're a lot higher today uh, because mm -hmm. of that. But I don't see the conflict in Ukraine causing that. I don't, I don't think people realize that Ukraine is a $143 billion a year economy. That is a minuscule GDP in terms of uh, in we are a... 28 trillion dollar economy or something like that uh mm -hmm. even russia's economy they're not a first rate power in terms of economic might they're not a second rate power in terms of economic might they're mm -hmm. a third rate power in terms of economic might and our economies unlike us in china our economies are not all that uh heavily intertwined and um you know the i think what a lot of folks don't realize is that a conflict between Ukraine and Russia and um, the sanctions that we're going to place on Russia are, I don't, I would hope that this is not the intention of uh, the Biden administration or any administration, but it will actually benefit us in the long run. In the long run, but short term, of course, that's probably, yes. if, if, and when you're talking about investing, you have to look at both the short term, the immediate and the long term. So when in the short term, you've heard you know, the oil and gas, everyone, you know, gas doesn't go to, I mean, seven and then the, the far, far conspiracy, it's going to go to $13, but you've got, <laughs> you've got that, you've got wheat, you know, they're major exporters of wheat that so, you know, all, all things made with wheat probably going to go up. And the, the one that I actually was on a call with, uh, I was on BlackRock investment call and they were talking about um, how they're a large exporter of nickel, which is used in the EV car uh, factories, yeah. right? So you've got oil and you've got car manufacturers and you've got gas, so you've got supply chain. So th that's gonna probably be the short term. And in which case, um, you know, are you going to be investing in those areas for the short term? You know, probably not. I, right? I think I think chemical manufacturing may be one of the best investments uh, for, for the near term if sanctions are going to be around for a while. Um, so I've heard on uh, TikTok recently and on YouTube, a bunch of people crying about uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, you know, them, them withholding ammonium nitrate supplies. 
claiming this vast conspiracy by Russia to uh, deprive us of fertilizer, which is going to push mm -hmm. up gas prices. Uh, folks, this is not true at all. Um, and, and if you think that, then you, you probably didn't do too well in high school chemistry. Uh, ammonium nitrate is made in two different ways. Uh, number one, using atmospheric nitrogen, which that's the, it comprises the, the most, what, the most common element in our atmosphere is nitrogen. It's 78% of all the air you breathe and uh, natural gas, right? That is how you make, uh, make fertilizer. And we are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. We have uh, these chemical complexes, these chemical production complexes all over, uh, you know, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, California, um, and places uh, in Canada as well. And in Mexico, we can produce mass amounts of fertilizer. The only reason we were getting ammonium nitrate from Russia is because they don't take any safety precautions and it's a lot cheaper to produce it over there. But they stopped exporting ammonium nitrate to keep it out of the hands of potential insurgents. And if you know basic chemistry, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what, what I'm talking about, that's fine. I'm not going to explain it on the yeah, air. Yeah, so. yeah, Jason, just just so we're clear, most of us uh, did not do well in, in high school chemistry, okay? Most of us didn't uh, do any of those things. If I, I can identify three or four elements on the elemental chart, probably. Really? So, yeah, so, so basically, so it's atmospheric nitrogen and nitric acid and water, right? And the nitric acid is derived from natural gas. And we have, uh, and this has been, this is going to be great for American natural gas producers. We have had a struggling market for liquid natural gas exports for a really long time because of cheap gas being exported to Western Europe through pipelines. Now that that supply is, is not, it's not cut off, but it might be in the future. But it also, this is the giant push that Europe needed in order to uh, d diversify their sources of gas. Mm -hmm. um, they had become they've become so dependent on Russia, and I think right. that this is a giant miscalculation economically uh, on the part of uh, Russia. And I think that uh, it might actually end up precipitating the collapse of Russia as we know it, not completely, but as we know it. So well, as, um, as things as you're forced into these conflicts and forced to look outside the box and problem solve as opposed to just take the easy route because Russia it's because it's right there. You're forced to do other things. And so I think when you look at um, the European Union, you look at America and you look at being forced to finally do all these other things, maybe become uh, energy independent, not 100 percent, but, you know, mostly I think that, like you said, could be a good thing for us in the long run. However, in the short term, it is going to affect the market and it's going to yeah. affect our paychecks, it's going to affect our wallet. And uh, but that's short term. Now, knock on wood, that is uh, a sh uh, it is very short term. Um, I'll just keep my fingers crossed that uh, that the adults uh, in the room prevail. It, well, let me explain how short term it is. Russia is in very your, quickly in your going opinion. To, in your opinion, uh, right? In my opinion, uh, okay. so I, I don't think they have a choice here. They pretty much pick the worst country to pick on when it comes to Ukraine, not because they're powerful, not because they're all that well equipped, uh, but because of the threat of insurgency. I think they're going to try and leave before that happens. They're really just trying to demilitarize um, Ukraine at this point and install mm -hmm. a puppet government. Uh, but they chose people that look just like them to pick on. They chose people that speak the same language that they do. Every Ukrainian speaks Russian as well. Mm -hmm. um, they chose people you can't differentiate or how they look. It's not their uniform. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? This is going to be a giant bloody mess for uh, Russia in the long term. And it's going to be a giant economic drag on them in the long term. And I think this is a giant miscalculation on their part. And I think well, this what, is going to be the short term, but what is, so that's long term. You said long term. What is yep. the short term economic nature of it? Short term it economic a, nature of this is, is going to be increased months? prices at the pump, even so though is it the three month, is it a 12 month? Be what, what is short term to you? I think it could be to me? nine months. Okay. Um, yeah. Nine months. That's I think it could be longer. Yeah. So they've not been cut off from global payment networks at this point. Uh, but they can't raise money from bond issues right. at all. Uh, their cash reserves are going to be dwindling daily. They're not going to be able to export most of their chemicals at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so they, and they we're not cutting them off completely from from oil markets because they need that to feed themselves. You know, right. their their people. But the threat of personal sanctions against Putin or against the oligarchs, I don't think, is really all that uh, powerful. Right. I don't think they really care that much about money. They have all the power in the world that they want. So 
Um, no, I, I think this in a lot of ways is a watershed moment for our relationship. Um, but yeah, so I, I, for our relationship with Russia, I think it's never going to be the same after this, at least mm -hmm. until this current oligarchy dies off or something changes. But I think we're actually seeing the end of Vladimir Putin uh, because of this. And uh, well, that's a prediction, of course, and humans yeah. are bad at predictions. Me yeah. too. Uh, but honestly, I think this may be a giant miscalculation in that the uh, the oligarchs that are in place in Russia may end up replacing him at some point with someone else. This is not going to work too well for him. The cost in terms of money is too much to bear. And uh, you know, I made the point when we were talking before we went on air that back when the Soviet Union, right before they collapsed, um, the the GDP per capita was roughly eighty nine hundred dollars per cap per person in the Soviet Union, which was fairly respectable even by today's standards. Respectable, not great. It's like roughly seven times less than ours is. But today, Russia's GDP per capita is like ten thousand three hundred dollars per person. They've only raised GDP per capita over thirty years by eight percent, while the rest of Europe has tripled and quadrupled and. This is a country that's falling behind. This is the last gasp of empire in 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 in, in what I what I see. So, um, yeah. Hold on a second. So when you're looking at so one of the uh, economy is doing good, but it's not what I see. What do you see? Uh, what I see is the economy is struggling. In terms of me personally and and as a professional, I think the economy is struggling to find its foothold um, after after the pandemic. We've got a lot of other a lot of issues in our own right here on our own soil to kind of deal with. But I think that uh, I'm optimistic about the economy over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I just think we're struggling to find a, a solid foothold um, to to drive off of. And when you have inflation. When you have inflation fear, that is the highest points ever. It's been in a very long time. When you have inflation fear, when you have unemployment, when you have, uh, you know, a an election coming up in the at the end of the year that could, pot, could possibly change policy, uh, and now you throw this war in, it, all of those things are uncertainties, and the market doesn't deal well with uh, uncertainty. No beer. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, look, well, I can, I can grab a whiskey if you need to. You pulled me uh, off. Usually on, on Wednesday right nights, there. when I on Wednesday nights, I usually drink beer while I'm doing my. Uh, my uh, live stream here, uh, but uh, it's the middle of the day and I'm going to go train later. So no, no beer today. No, beer um, today. <laughs> no and I, I, I agree with you on, on most of those points. Um, I, I do think though, that like we've discussed this before that the timing markets is really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And people that bail out usually forget that the worst days in the market are usually followed really quickly by the best days in the market. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think the statistic is within 10 days, uh, statistically, like over the you've all seen that, uh, you know, 10 worst days in the market over 20 years research. Yeah. They've been doing it since 2005 every year. And every year, the statistical uh, result is the same, is that investors who simply stayed invested did better than those who tried to get out of the market when they thought things were going bad and then jump back in later because mm -hmm. the market rarely hangs on to any single day gains. In fact, that uh, the original research was done in 2005, where uh, Fidelity looked at their accounts from 1985 to 2005, and they determined that if you missed the 10 best trading days, yeah. you know, in a 20-year period, your return went from 11.3% yeah. down to 3.8%. Right. 10 days out of a 20-year period. And that, the thought was at the time that that research was an anomaly, but the reality was it wasn't. They've done rolling research every year since then. And it's been that way. And, and here's the issue. The opposite of that research has been done, which was if you were out of the market on the on the 10 worst days of the uh, time period, what did things look like? The problem is, is people missed both of those mm -hmm. on average. They missed the best days and they missed the worst days. So the, the, when uh, when we were in, you know, when we worked in wire, in brokerage houses and wire houses, yeah. we had all those. Uh, all those that paraphernalia that you could show. Hey, look, here's here's a beautifully ch beautiful chart that shows that if you miss ten days, this is the reason why we don't market time. If you um, if you're all into one index versus being diversified across with you know the best performing asset classes over the last thirty years and how they they jump around in a balanced portfolio, you know how we had all those things to show. And now with when we have the most information available to us at the touch of a button. Um, all those those simple and easy things kind of go out the window because you're dealing with you, you're we're you're dealing with human emotion, right? It's um, true. I, it's I had true. to talk. I had to talk someone off the ledge this morning at 5 a.m. 
uh, wanted to sell sell his equities and go into cash. And uh, and we he wanted to do that two two years ago. And only, so we I say we because I'm included with him. We have been his worst enemy over the last three years. So even though he's very financially well off and he has a very very good solid portfolio he is not immune and i am not immune to having those emotional drawbacks and um i had to talk him off this morning at five o'clock my time five o'clock right. my time san diego time he's in he lives in uh, rhode island but uh it's you need those you need to have a solid plan for your future so that that doesn't affect your emotions and your trading today I had someone back in 2009 that I failed to talk off the ledge mm -hmm. and uh, she paid for it. Um, meaning that she has basically not really been able to recover her losses. Yep. It really affected her future and she was forced to go back to work and then she mm -hmm. was laid off in 2020. Um, so this happened. Uh, so I think the conversation was like, so March 9th of 2009, I think was the bottom. And I think it would have been like February 24th or 25th when I had this conversation with her where we've already gone through the worst. She was a client that I had, I had gotten like in October the year before. So I hadn't worked with her that long. So she had, uh, you know, she had, she belonged to someone else at that point. That person left the company. I inherited the client. She and I had a fairly good relationship, but I didn't know her that well. And no matter what I talked about, I'm like, look, we, we were kind of, pretty close to the bottom. Now the market's down close to 50%. This is as bad as it's going to get. You know, the other end of this equation is that the economy collapses forever and, yeah. and everything that you are fearing, matter, right? it doesn't matter. Your money's yeah. worthless, right? Exactly. That's the other end of that equation, right? Mm -hmm. So you might as well hang on from this point out. And I could do nothing to, to convince her to stay in the market at that point. March 9th was the bottom. I didn't know it was the bottom. Did you know it was yeah. the bottom? I, I 100 percent knew it was the bottom. My uh, my <laughs> magic my magic eight ball said I right. like, I asked it every day. Is this the bottom? And it said it's decidedly so. Right. I, I put, didn't know it was the I bottom. I put all of my money in. Then I, I I took all the money out of my house and I put it all on black. And then boom. There you go. Right. Go. Yeah, but by, but so that was February or March 9th was the bottom. Yep. By June the market was back up by 30 or 40 percent. Mm -hmm. I give her a call. My like, hey, let's think about you know, whatever. And this is, I've been calling her the whole time, but no, no, it's, it's the, the, the economy is still collapsing. The yep. world is ending everything. And like, she was going on and on with these, uh, with these different scenarios. And I'm like, every situation you're describing is a situation where money doesn't work at all. So what, well, I mean, th this is, this is an unrealistic worry. You, you might as well be investing. You, you might as well be preparing for a zombie apocalypse, yeah, you exactly. know, which that's one of my favorite subjects on the planet is a zombie apocalypse. But so I could never convince her to get back into the market. You know, a few months later, she moves her money. I ended up encountering, encountering her years later uh -huh. when she had burned through her savings at that point, right? Uh, did not adjust her lifestyle whatsoever in terms of what she was spending, even though she was so afraid that everything was going to collapse. She ended up having to go back to work. And then the last time I spoke to her, she had actually gotten yeah. laid off uh, because of COVID. And I probably i suspect that things have not gotten better for her you know and I'm, I'm sure that you probably felt bad that you weren't able to convince her that what was in her best interest i know that's typically how i feel whenever you know i i have i went through that so this uh client that i was just mentioning earlier uh in, two and a half years ago he was nervous about the economy and covid and so he sold everything out it took me a year to get him to, to, to move back in. And so we dollar cost average. And uh, usually I want to do like a six months dollar, dollar cost average. He right. wanted to do it over 12 months. And so that, you know, that was 20, 2021, right. And uh, where we had a pretty solid return. And so today it used to actually said the words um, or on uh, early on, on your, on your speech there is I told him, I said, if you well, let's learn from our past, we did essentially what he wanted to do last time and, time the market and it didn't work out for us. Uh, and I always include myself in it, right? I always say it's we, cause you know, it's, right. it's, we're tied together. But I said, if you do, if you pull out and you continue to market time, like we did last time, I said, you will never recover. And you say, you're like, she never recovered. She never I, told them, I said, you'll never recover. Your wife is 15 years younger than you are. This has to last for X amount of years. Um, and the market's going to go up, it's going to go down, but we're investing the way we need to in order for you to maintain your lifestyle for the next 30 years and your wife's lifestyle for the next 35 years. Um, so we know this won't work, 
this is the only way that it can work. And so that, so I said, look, here's, and I gave him a couple other options of compromise. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, you said it, you will never recover. Yeah. You know, in, in every advisor who's been in the business for 20 years, like we have, uh, actually you're younger than I am. So a little bit less, <laughs> but the, bit the, younger. the issue with that is we've actually seen hundreds, if not thousands of failure stories mm -hmm. for people who refuse to understand the statistical realities of, of investing is that the more active you are, the more likely you are to fail. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a, that's a, a very, very, uh, it's not sad. It's just a very interesting thing. It, it really, it, it goes to show how, how really bad humans are trying to pick and choose the times to uh, invest. So um, let, let's move on to a few things here. Um, lots of news pundits in the UK are speculating this could spread to other former Soviet and NATO countries. Uh, what do you think the, of the impacts this could be on Western financial markets? So, I mean, the very first thing we're going to do if that happens is cut them off from the global payments network. And um, I made this point to Ryan that, uh, you know, that, that earlier we're talking about the, the GDP with uh, Russia, that they've fallen so far behind compared to other Western countries and in Eastern Europe that we will do to them exactly what we did to them at the end of the Soviet Union. We're going to precipitate an economic collapse and this time it's going to happen a lot more quickly because they're in much worse financial condition and mm -hmm. they don't have any trading partners anymore. They had the whole, you know, the whole communist bloc to trade with before, and that doesn't exist anymore. Um, they, they don't have, you know, everyone's saying, oh, they have China. China likes to do business with us too, you know, um, and they're going to do everything they can to maintain good relationships with both of us. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to choose sides in this. Um, so I, I think that, that the, I think that, like I said, that's a huge miscalculation on his part as well, because we will cut him off from hard currency. Um, let me see here. Putin's invasion reminds me of Thanos ending credit scene in Age of Ultron. Fine. I'll do it myself. I feel like we're greatly underestimating his action. That's always the case. We could be under underestimating his action. But I but I can tell you uh, one thing that his intentions have been absolutely clear for the last 20 years. Yep. Absolutely yeah. clear. He wants to revive the uh, the Soviet Union. I, I think that just like the American empire extended too far, the Soviet empire has extended too far and we both need to mind our own business. So what are, what, like, what are we going to do today? Uh, the same thing we try to do every day, Pinky, try and that's take right. over the world. Right. I mean, it's just, God, it, it's I loved great. Pinky in the brain. Man, I, I love it. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I appreciate the Thanos reference. Yep. Yeah. I do appreciate that. So why did green stocks go up today? Um, so, Asking why stocks go up or down on a particular day is not a question that can really be answered. Um, right. The market doesn't always behave rationally in the short term. Mm -hmm. It's only rational if you look at it over a long period of time. Now, are we talking about are we talking about EV stocks or are we talking about all kinds uh, of green energy stocks or, today, or like, cannabis yeah. or cannabis stocks? Oh, we're definitely we're not. I don't talk oh, okay. a lot about cannabis stocks. Okay, and uh, the only reason I don't talk a lot about cannabis stocks is because they're frozen out of. Uh, you know, U.S. financial networks at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything against cannabis stocks. It's just that it's very hard for them to do business in the U.S. Correct. when you can't access U.S. banks. You know? But essentially, so so I had a I had a client just to be a completely off topic for a second. Yeah. Uh, so I had a client that was interested in in entering that space, and so um, so I had a two to three weeks worth of uh, of research on that industry and how kind of how it works. So. Um, uh, full disclosure, I do own a few, uh, cannabis companies that are based out of Canada. And yeah, so that's I, the only and, place I would buy them. Well, that, yeah. yeah. So I do own a few of those, um, just, and that, that is, but that is a long-term because a change in policy could essentially set those things off similar to how the EV credits kind of, uh, EV credits years ago, kind of, um, sparked the fire for, for cars right. and stuff like that. So, um, that's just a full disclosure. I do on some of those. When he said green, I was like, Oh, which one is it? You know, is it the EV? Yeah. Or, hey okay. man, this is Cal. Hey, Cr Chris, this is California. <laughs> so that is a valid question when it comes to, uh, weed stocks. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, just, Hey, you know, you, you never know it's California, right? Right. Uh, uh so interestingly enough, when it comes to, to weed stocks, I think this is way off topic. Um, I, I do think that retail stocks are actually a little bit more attractive than uh, companies involved in production. 
Uh, they're just not attractive in the U.S. because they can't access, uh, you know, payment networks. Right. But in Canada, there are a couple of retailers that are fairly attractive. Someone in my Patreon group uh, brought up a couple of these. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but uh, name and name some of the ones that you might uh, own. And of course, this is uh, not a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security. Yeah, no. Uh, so I have uh, Sundial Growers. Okay. Um, and then I have uh, Canopy Growth. Canopy, okay, Canopy Growth. Yeah. yeah so Canopy uh, Growth is one, would be one of those. Two, they're the two big ones. Yeah. The, a Sundial is a is a. Fifty-one dollar, fifty-one cent stock, uh, but yeah. they actually are the first ones, first um, growth, uh, sorry, cannabis company to actually have positive earnings, um, uh, and that was last year. So that's the, it's the only one that has since. Normally, right. it's you know you're only seeing um, deficits, but this was the only one that actually turned a profit. So that's uh, one that I've owned. I've owned that one since it was like really, really small. So there's but actually a couple of cannabis retailers that are traded publicly on uh, mm -hmm. the Canadian exchange. So I don't, I don't remember who they are off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. uh, somebody actually made a really compelling case that because of the way that uh, you know, they're, they're limited from payment systems and because of all the risk you take in the growing operations with yeah. all the equipment and capital you need to get started, that the retail locations may actually be a safer investment. Uh, for this. Uh, and, and he made a really compelling case. I just can't remember any of those off the top of my head right now. That's something we should probably research uh, later okay. on. Wow. So. So if, uh, if you find it, send uh, send it to me. I'm always, I always like, you know, as an advisor, you know that you don't know everything. And so the more yeah. information you have, uh, the better. And it was, I would have never looked at that industry had a client not asked me to look into it. Um, and so that's... Uh, oh. On this live stream all the time, people ask me about stocks and industries. And many times there are companies that I have not thought of. Like I may have seen them in passing and said, oh, I need to look into that one day. Yeah. And I just never got around to it. Um, you know, Sundial Growers was one that I looked at uh, almost two years ago, maybe a year yeah. and a half ago. Uh, didn't end up investing in it. But uh, yeah, if they're turning a profit, that might be something. Or at least they have one positive quarter of earnings. That's mm -hmm. better than all the rest of them. Right. right. And they're, and they're, and they're, they were a, a 40, I think I bought them at 48 cents. Uh, and so I put, you know, X amount of dollars. And then again, uh, it's a, it's a long-term holding because in, in, you know, over two year policy change could legalize it and right. boom, they're off and running. So they seem to be the most, those two companies, Canopy Growth, the two biggest and Sundial, that's one of your a person says it's vertically integrated. Uh, they seem most poised to benefit from something like that. So that's just, Right. But, so Sundial yeah. seems vertically integrated from production to retail. So yeah. uh, that's something I was not aware of when it came to, to Sundial. So yeah. So um, there you go. yeah. And I don't even know, like are Canadian growers allowed to export to the United States? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that either. I don't so, know that uh, this either. is say this is an industry that we don't know that much about, um, but there's lots of industries that we don't know a lot about. Um, so one of the things that, that I, I know quite a bit about that I never talk about on the channel is the chemical industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I never talk about it because it's just boring and nobody likes it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, but it's an integral part of our economy and one of the spaces that I think every investor should, should know about. Um, and there's a lot of diversified ETFs out there that you can own to cover that part of the industry. And mm -hmm. we're actually facing, because of supply constraints right now, we're facing what has been called a molecule crisis. We are out of many of the precursor chemicals that we need to uh, produce the things that we want to sell. And that has to do with outrageous demand for things right now. It's things that, that demand that, that no one was prepared for. That is, when, as the pandemic has ended, people have gone out and said, I want to spend money. And uh, it, it's just the, the demand is absolutely incredible. And that is one of the huge drivers of our supply crisis right now. One of the huge drivers of wage growth, one of the huge drivers of inflation, I think, is just the absolute um, you know, unprecedented demand that we have right now for mm -hmm. stuff, things, everything at this point. So uh, right. to, to go back on topic as the reasons why yes. you shouldn't invest or okay. reasons why you didn't invest. What Are we on number three? I think we're on number three. Yeah. Oh, well, this is, the, well, this is the fun the, one. What were the reasons why, unless someone asked, uh, is there anything that you want to, that we purchased recently that you want to say? I mean, I don't, I, I have to tell, I tell all my clients what I own uh, individually. 
So if if, if you want to cover that, I'm I'm okay with. That. Actually, that has not come across my screen yet, so I don't see it. Um, yeah. I, like the last thing I saw was uh, I did read that Sundial paid off all their debt. Um, mm-hmm. that's great if they did. Uh, so, so debt is debt for uh, he's actually a listener in the UK or a, a watcher from the UK. Oh, so, um, I, I don't know how it happened, but I have lots of subscribers from all over the world. Like I, when I started the YouTube channel, I was like, oh, I'll probably just have most people coming from the United States. Not true. <laughs> Ruggedly so. Handsome is, is universal. Ruggedly yeah. Handsome is universal. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let me see here. Hi, Jason. What do you think of Alibaba? Have you had time to check the earnings release today? Uh, no, I haven't had time to check the earnings release today. Uh, I know that predictions were that they were going to see a giant decline in earnings. So I have not uh, taken a look at them yet today. Uh, I, I will later. It's not a stock typically that I cover. Mm-hmm. I've had uh, tons of issues with uh, invest. I've had tons of stumbling blocks investing in Alibaba in the past. Um, yeah. So oddly enough, and I, I've done, like I said, I've been investing and in researching for a long time, especially with international investments. Uh, I don't have investments in Russia. I do have investments in China, and you is should be asking pur- is yourself. Is that on purpose? Is that on purpose? It is on, definitely on purpose. Oh, okay. It is definitely on purpose. Um, and a lot of that has to do with where the money goes in each society and what they're doing to. If you look at the GDP growth per capita of China versus the GDP growth per capita of Russia, mm-hmm. at the direction of government, the resources of the nation have been used to improve the lives of citizens in one country and to enrich oligarchs in another, I'll let you guys yeah. guess which one. Okay. But I've actually done business in Russia in the past before. I've never actually done real business in China before. I've just been there a couple of times. But there's a reason why I invest in one country to a limited degree, and why I will not invest in in the other country. Um, so yeah. So the uh, to give I guess a little a little bit more a background. So I'm on institutional calls, um, institutional money management calls with Vanguard, with uh, BlackRock, and Fidelity. And they've over the last, I think it's about three or four months, they've been moving out of uh, large cap growth over international and moving more into large cap value. It's one of the first times, and I would say in the, in the last seven to eight years that I can remember people talking about international value. Typically, right. it's just international growth and, and emerging markets. Um, and with emerging markets, pretty much everyone is having. So we say international, value. we're looking at developed international, developed like Western international. Europe, Japan. Yeah, okay. large cap, large cap. Uh, growth international. It's one of the first uh, time in seven or eight years where uh, institutional money managers are talking about large value as opposed to large growth. So that was that was interesting. Over the last three or four months, we've seen that. So, so, well, I, well, I do think there's plenty of opportunity there. I, I noticed that one of the um, the uh, the mid cap fund, international mid cap funds that I own, mm-hmm. has dipped significantly, and I added to it this morning. Um, just a few shares here and there, but because the value, I think it was just too great at that point yeah. uh, for me to ignore, but not that it was tons of money and I'm certainly not an institutional investor, but I definitely see that there are longer term opportunity for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, it, it, I don't know if you've seen the research done on what portfolios did best in a high inflation environment. And mm-hmm. the number one portfolio that did really well in a high inflation environment was a 50, 50 portfolio. 50% mm-hmm. stocks, 50% bonds, yeah. right? The problem with that is the high coupon rates that were paid on bonds. Right. And and even before we went into that really high period of inflation, starting in 1973, 72, 73, that coupon rates for bonds were already 6 8%, right? Um, and we have been basically bond uh, bond yields have declined every year, not not every single year in lockstep, but yeah. if you look at the trend line over a long trend, period of time, yeah, since 1994, right. it's been going down. Yeah. And we've also seen uh, dividends decline from S&P 500 down to roughly 2%, where historically they were 40% of the return over of portfolio the return. Yeah. was dividends, right? So the only place to find those high dividends now is basically in large cap value in, uh, in, in Western Europe at this point. So yeah. I, I do think that is a, a smart move if you're thinking pretty far in the future, and if you think that inflation is going to last longer than a couple of years, you're going to have that income to support your portfolio. So, large cap, large institutional money managers. You know, I mean, BlackRock is handling the bond buying for the government, so I figure they know uh, they have a pretty close insight as to what things are, how things are going to work. But it's always interesting to see how how large money because they have to move a lot more 
uh, they, you know, they press a button and companies die, right? So right. if they move their, if they withdraw their support, companies die. But it's always, you, I do those calls at least once a month on uh, each platform. And actually the, this last month, um, Schwab was the only one that actually mentioned, uh, said the word recession. Uh, out of the five institutional money management calls. Yeah, they were the that's, only uh, that's, that's the funny it. thing. Is institutional money managers have not been talking about recession they until the last the week. Not yeah, the, word. the word. For all yeah. of the talk in the media, especially all the talk on, on YouTube, institutional money managers are like, we're, the leading indicators are not saying that we're going to yeah. have a recession. So uh, that Schwab may be changing. Schwab yeah, Schwab was the only one out of five that actually said, the. they didn't say we're headed there, but they just yeah. said, Here's they defined what their version of a recession is, and it was they were the only ones to do so out of five. So uh, you know they were that one dentist that didn't re that didn't recommend uh, you know crest whitening or whatever. Uh, better get him on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, go, let's go. So what are the the, the worst? Oh, reasons the last reason. Why, the last reason. Someone? The funny one. Yeah. The funny one. I wrote down. I've a heard. Few. I had to go back. I had to go back to find all the terrible reasons why people or not the terrible reasons what. When someone said they didn't want to invest because of these things, I was I had nothing. I was like, oh, um, all right. Yeah, no, this is this is the one. This is the one. And, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit before. I've had this at least a dozen times in my career where someone will make an appointment, come down, sit with me, talk to me for an hour, and then say, yeah, I'm not going to invest. Well, well, why is that? Well, because the rapture is coming. <laughs> or because the new world order is going to overthrow and money is going to be worthless. And I'm like, well... So you're sitting on all this cash, right? That's earning nothing. You think that there's going to be a global economic collapse uh, because the new world order is taking over or the rapture is coming or there's going to be a zombie apocalypse. That's my favorite one, zombie apocalypse. Um, and I, I have literally encountered that twice where people literally thought that all of the zombie movies were setting us up for an actual zombie apocalypse, um, which I spent hours talking with these people because it was fascinating. Just of course you would, Jason. Of oh my god! Like I ended up canceling a following appointment just so I could hear this one guy talk about his plans to survive the zombie apocalypse, and I realized his plans were far inferior to mine. But the 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 the, the thing that 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 blows me away is in every situation is why are you keeping a half a million dollars in the savings account, which is what these people had, if you think that money's going to be worthless? No, there's right? no point of it. There's no point. Like if you're wrong and money isn't worth it, at least you're invested now and now you have more money down the road. If you are correct, like you lose no matter what. You lose if you're wrong. You lose if you're right. If you don't invest, if you have these apocalyptic visions of our future. So you might as well invest at least some of that. Of course, keep an emergency reserve. Uh, yeah. You and I disagree on how large that emergency right. reserve can be. Yeah. Uh, but yes, but no, I, I the, the rapture thing is my, was one of my favorites but the zombie apocalypse one was absolutely my favorite so i had the i had the the only time i ever came across then uh, granted i would have been like okay really i, I don't know how i would have reacted but well, no i'll keep I, the crazies around the only time i had that uh i had the i ran into a rapture was in um an estate planning document where it was in the event because you don't really die you just kind of ascend it was like in the event yeah. of rapture what happens to the money i'm like i've never i'd never heard i think tucker smith was the one that that uh was on the call with me on that one yeah. Uh, shout out to Tucker on this one. But speaking of a lose lose situation, uh, the one that I had that when you right when you said this was the topic today, I immediately went to it was um, reason not to invest was this uh, this person. I'm going to try to remain as gender neutral as possible here. This client, uh, not client, but this person came in and said that uh, I don't, you know, I've got all this, uh, you know, give me your thoughts. And I, I, you know, doing the whole program. Here's Here's what you have. Here are the options. Here's, you know, rates of re expected rate of return, blah, blah, the risk, all that stuff. And he's like, oh, you know what? I, I just wanted to hear it. I'm not going to invest because I'm, I'm going to be getting a divorce and I don't want to give the, the spouse anything. So he had a bunch. He had a bunch of cash. Again, I said it was a he. Oh, I yeah. got me. Oh, I got me. He was like, yeah, he had a bunch of cash and he didn't want to put it anywhere on paper because then his wife would have uh, had claim to it when he got divorced. And. I had, I had nothing after that. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, you got nothing. Uh, well, got nothing. I, I don't know what to tell you, my friend. Um, yep. Yeah. So, um, so we, this is, would you continue to hold Australian lithium companies for the long term given China tensions? Um, so that could be problematic anyway. Not, not just because I don't think lithium, not, not because I think lithium is not going to be exploited in Australia. It will be exploited in Australia, 
the problem is most of these companies there are relatively new or relatively small. Uh, I don't know which ones that you're referring to, but I, I'm encountering this a lot where people are asking me about different lithium companies. And it's they're a lot like wildcatters. If you're investing in a wildcatter, uh, which is oil exp exploration, you have no idea what you're getting in terms of the mm -hmm. ability of these guys to actually exploit the claims and the oil that they discover, right? So it's not just the fact that they're finding lithium. It's do they have the expertise? Do they have the experience? And can they raise the money to capitalize right. and expand? And that that's I think that owning lithium investments right now is far it, it's a far better choice to do that through a diversified mutual fund or etf uh, there's a couple of them out there that specialize in the lithium supply chain uh yeah so when so, you're but, when you're looking at something that's highly specified like the lit like lithium i would probably so typically i'm an etf guy right because of their they're inexpensive and they don't typically um and they they perform at the index and versus the yeah. mutual fund, which history has, it doesn't, doesn't outperform. But in that situ in a situation where you're highly specified that way, instead of owning an ETF that is just, that is owning companies um, in that space uh, versus a mutual fund that might do a little bit more research and balance sheets before owning, um, I would probably want to see those two side by side. Cause in that situation, maybe the actual mutual fund manager might have a little bit more data uh, and what and as to what companies are, you know, have the best uh, drilling technology or have the best. Way to yeah. fund. So that That's a really good point. I'd be interested to see those side to side. That's a really uh, good point. I think that the yeah. lithium industry right now is dominated by Albemarle. You basically have Albemarle and everyone else. OK, everyone else is in terms of, um, you know, they're, they're, the business involved in producing precursor chemicals for the lithium battery industry. Everyone else is pretty far behind them. So it's kind of the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. An ETF is going to hold everything, right? Right. A mutual fund may be a little bit more focused. Like this early in the right. development of this industry, it may be that active management really does outperform mm -hmm. passive management for a period of time. Now, once the industry is more, more mature, right. I don't believe that'll be the case. But for the next 10 years, it could very well be the case that an actively mm -hmm. managed mutual mm -hmm. fund focused on the lithium supply chain or an actively managed ETF yeah. may actually be a far superior investment. Yeah, you know, that's, I, I, that's, uh, I, I'd like to see, I would probably uh, want to see those two put side by side because normally you are an ETF guy because of the expense, because of the history and all yes. those things. But, you know, um, there is a lot to be said for mutual funds and their mutual and managers in certain spaces, right? Yep. Uh, Crispy Tacos 84 asks, does Ryan have a financial advising practice? The answer is yes. Why don't you tell them uh, about it? Uh, so I am the owner operator of True Fiduciary Capital, um, where I do wealth management as well as financial planning. Um, I am fee only, so I do not earn any uh, any compensation outside of uh, an agreement between me and my cl my clients and I. So no no products are sold whatsoever, and I act as a fiduciary in that capacity. Excellent, excellent, good to hear, and. Uh, I think 99.9% .9 of the people that I bring onto the podcast are probably going to end up being that way. That is just the type of conversations and advice that I sure. want to bring to this channel. But also, um, you basically can't get people that work for a major wirehouse on this channel. They yeah. Their companies will not allow them to speak publicly, period. Mm -hmm. um, you have the freedom to say what you really want and really believe, uh, yeah. which other folks in the industry cannot do that, which is one of the reasons why I refuse to go back and you know, work for a major firm is because I will not be able to have this channel to do that. I would not be able right. to say what I want to say. So, and you know me, Ryan, I'm always saying crazy stuff anyway. You, you, yes. And that's one of the reasons, that is one of the main reasons why I continue to talk to you and uh, <laughs> on a regular basis. Because, but, because, you, because as, as, as intelligent as you are, as intelligent as you are, as, as articulate as you are, you force that other side of my brain that is uh, it to start to activate, to question some of my, some of the things that I, you know, you just hold to be true. And so someone that is as different as you are to me, it, it awakens that, Hey, you know, you know, I know for a fact now that I don't know everything because I met Jason and he knows. <laughs> uh, so it awakens that it challenges you to, and your challenges, your convictions and the way you think, like I would have never, um, outside of this conversation, most of the time I'd be like, "Yo, you know what? Uh, ETFs versus mutual funds." I would have said ETFs, but in our conversation now, it's like, "Oh, you know, I want to see the data on that." Yeah, no, I, I would definitely want to see the data on that too. Like, I think that that may 
be the, the lithium industry may be the perfect opportunity to choose active management over an ETF or at least uh, you know a passive ETF just because of how nascent the industry is. And how many of these companies will fail? That is a guarantee. Right. Many of these lithium companies popping up. And there are, I get questions every day about with, from lithium companies that have like $30 million in market cap, $50 million in market cap. These are tiny companies. Yeah, that's that, small. And, and most of them are going to fail. And a lot of them may not even be real. Um, I, I don't know if you remember the whole, you know, Chinese reverse merger, small cap scandals that went on between like 2011 and 2013, that in that time period, more companies, there were more companies kicked, the Chinese companies kicked off of US markets because of fraud and uh, uh, than there were actual legitimate companies. I just remember the movie Gold, uh, where the guy was fabricating how much gold he found in uh, in a drilling expedition in order to get more money so that he could um, shelter it and stuff. So I remember that that movie. Yeah. But this is, this yeah. is no, no, I did. I I owned a number of these investments. One was like Longway Petroleum that supposedly had had uh, had this like series of of uh you know, of petrol stations in northern China, and it turned out that it was all fake. That none of it existed. Another one was a media company that supposedly was like advertising on buses, and it turned out that they the buses that they said they were advertising on didn't even exist. But these were companies that were like fifty dollars in U.S. exchanges, you know, uh, you know, million shares changing hands a day, and they were complete frauds. Uh, right. I, I just can't remember the names of those companies now. But many of these lithium companies are probably going to be in in the in the same uh, boat here pretty soon. Well, how soon really we out. how soon we forget uh, those things? You know, that happened twenty thirteen. Now we have a kind of a new wave of those things, which you know could be another conversation altogether with cryptos and and, and NFTs, uh, where those you know things are there's no product or or what have you and they're just getting pumped and not regulated pumped up by the influencer or celebrity that's producing them and then yeah. and then the rug pull so i mean well uh, so in, nfts are here to stay um but the current craze around basically just selling a jpeg and, and for half a million dollars I, I don't that may stay around really just as a collector's item or someone wants to buy a piece of history but i think it's a really crappy investment in that way, but NFTs as a way to create scarcity and uniqueness, those are here mm -hmm. to stay. And, and they're going to be applications yeah. that we cannot predict. Um, I was having this conversation with someone else the other day uh, that that kids born today, like I have, and when it comes to FinTech, I have like two different pathways for investment. Mm -hmm. One is uh, one is digital banking, uh, which is, I'm, I'm very heavily involved in like SoFi, Square, a couple of other things. And the other thing mm -hmm. is blockchain technologies, which I'm really betting on Square for, for blockchain technologies. Yep. Most people uh, are. A lot of people are. But I think that, and I'm kind of hedging my bets because I think the pathway between those two, one's going to one's gonna pretty much destroy the other one or severely disrupt the other one. I think that it's entirely possible that kids today, born today, will never have a bank account in the traditional sense that we have a bank account. I think it's entirely possible they never walk into a bank to get a loan. Everything's done through... Um, you know, a device. Press of a button. Yeah. Right. From the press I went, of a button. I went to the bank. I went to the bank yesterday, Jason. God, first I feel sorry for you. In like two years. Uh, I had cash for some reason. I needed a deposit before I spent it. So there you uh, go. There you go. <laughs> uh, here we go here. Uh, what do you guys know about vaccine stocks for you specifically? I'm looking at Novavax and uh, BioNTech. Uh, so actually, this is something that, that I've been studying for a very, very long time. Uh, I've been a, a holder of um, Moderna for a long time. It's not just a long-term investment. It's an extremely long-term investment. It's going to be extremely volatile. And if you don't have an appetite for risk, I would not invest. Here's the other thing. You, you don't know what's going to be successful and what's not going to be successful. I will say that, that, that um, it, it, you know, the mRNA technology, messenger RNA technology is going to be the way many, many vaccines are made in the future. Uh, mRNA technology is probably going to be, you're probably going to see a series of different varieties of cancer cured by mRNA vaccines here in the next 10 to 15 years. It's going to be huge. The problem is predicting who is going to uh, come up with those the quickest, get the uh, products to market the quickest is, is going to be very difficult to do. Um, I don't know enough about the end of the science behind each individual mm -hmm. vaccine. You don't know enough behind the science behind each indiv individual vaccine. Yeah. This is another one of those things where I don't think it's possible unless you are a geneticist and epidemiologist or cancer researcher. I don't think it's possible for you to really know whether or not this is going to be successful in advance. And you should hold as many of those companies as is reasonable, po reasonably possible. 
right. this is another one of those where it may be better to have an actively managed ETF or mutual fund. Right. And, and to, go, an to, to go with on to your, your, uh, your appetite for risk. Uh, so I, 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 Moderna was down. Uh, I remember, I, I think it was down in like our December, November, December, it was down like 14% in one day. And so I was like, oh, okay, you know, like Moderna, strong company, strong balance sheet, PE ratio was not everything, everything fit. And I'm like, okay, uh, I'll take it out of, out of 14% discount. So I bought, I bought into it. And then it just continued to dive and it hasn't recovered. So, um, you know, we don't always pick winners, especially individually. I mean, this was my individual account and full disclosure. And that's over a severely short term though. That's over a few Yeah, months. severely short term. So you have to hold on to these things if you are long term. But uh, just, to, just to be, I guess, different is that even professional investors don't pick winners all the time. And I, yeah. I so I don't manage, I manage a very small portion of my own individual uh, individual money. Um, because I am an irrational investor at times as well. So yeah. I'm not no. immune to any of those things when it comes to my own money. So someone else- Ryan, I've made, I've made this point. 70% of my invest, yeah. investment assets are just in, in passive investments. Yeah. Only about so, 30% uh, of my overall portfolio is in individual stocks. But I did I did take a loss on, on that Moderna because I bought into it and it was significantly risky, even though th at yeah. that time they were producing one of the top two vaccines in- uh, in in the U.S. around the world, so we're not. And, that, and that's the, the problem with any any drug maker is that you can't base it on what they're doing today. Yeah, you have to base it on what they have coming down the, the the road, right? And the big thing that they have coming down the road is that they have an AIDS vaccine that is in phase one trials. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if you don't understand the way drug trials are set up, you'd realize that this is big news, and it's not big news. And and I'll tell you why. Um, there's not an ethical way to expose people to AIDS, right? Mm -hmm. And the sample size for this group is fairly small. So all they're trying to do right now is prove that the vaccine won't kill the people in the, in the, in the, in the test group, but whether or not the drug works is not going to be known for, I don't know, a decade, I think at the mm -hmm. earliest, just because you have to get a large enough study right. and be dependent on a certain slice of that population being exposed to the AIDS virus to know whether or not that vaccine actually helps. And so that's, 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 you know, the third round of trials, that's a decade from now, that's thousands of participants. That's a year of looking at the data, millions of dollars of our billions of dollars yeah, being yeah, spent. Better. Every drug that makes it to market has had a minimum of a billion dollars being, being spent on it. Right. Every single one of them. So oh. I, I think that, that are the, the, so Genomics in general is an industry or an art form or science that's really in its infancy right now. It's heavily influenced also by AI technologies. We are in its infancy right now, but that is uh, the, the progress is going to accelerate faster and faster and faster and faster. And it's all tied into machine learning, which I find enormously exciting. Um, I'm such a giant nerd. I could go on for this forever. I know you don't. I, I don't want to much. say anything. I don't want to say anything. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan, Ryan's used to me going off on tangents for hours at a time. This is the reason I have a YouTube channel. It's like because I can talk about weird crap. Um, so here we let's talk about this. So do you know any of any opportunities in fusion power? So this is another thing that I'm a giant nerd on, uh, and I have another what, friend of mine. More, just one more arrow one more in the thing. quiver. There. Well, I have another friend of mine that I've been in a Facebook argument with for 12 years over this. Um, so I have actually been interested in fusion technology since I was eight years old. And nothing in the world of science has disappointed me more than fusion energy. Uh, I think it's a problem that we're going to solve one day. And we've made some enormous progress on that recently. But uh, most of this is Progress is being made not by private companies. It's being made by universities. It's, it's a, and the uh, the technology is going to be in the public domain. So, are there opportunities to invest in fusion technology? I don't believe there are right now. Uh, also, even if there was a company to invest in fusion technology, it'll it's a lot like investing in Virgin Galactic. Uh, it's not something that I jump on right away because they would not have an immediate pathway to profitability. Um, yeah, that's a that's a uh, yeah. Are you a fan of the All In podcast? I have never seen or heard I've the All In podcast. Never, never seen it. Uh, never seen or heard, but put it on the list. Put it on the list, and then yeah. uh, Olorende Ajay says, "I think that pick and shovel stocks are the best way to play genomic stocks." Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in MRVI. 
Um, that you may be correct on that. I think for a lot of industries, like the EV industries, may be may actually, if you missed out on Tesla, that the next best thing may be to invest in the lithium battery supply chain. I really mm -hmm. do. Here's a couple of other things not to ignore, though. Um, lithium is not the only element that is reactive in that manner. You should also be looking at the potassium, the potential potassium ion battery chain and the potential sodium ion battery chain. Uh, sodium has the benefit of not being limited geographically and uh, being very easy to mine and compare and, and to separate in comparison to um, uh, what, what are you shaking your head there for? I just hear the, the way your brain works is just I'm sitting here just watching you develop your thought. And it's just how you pull that much. How can you retain that much information? It's just always it's always fascinating to me when I ever I whenever I chat with you. You're, I don't sleep. A, that's why. Uh, it's, so, <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, uh, Mido Fusion's always fifteen years away. Yeah, yeah. F Fusion's I mean, always fifteen years away. Like, like I said, I read my first article in Fusion when I was eight years old. Um, and then when I was older and started to really understand like uh, the, the science behind it, I would literally uh, write. And this is before even emails. I remember writing a letter, putting a stamp on it to uh, a scientist at MAT. And I got a response six weeks later and the response was like his paper sent to me. And he, I guess he figured out from my handwriting that I was a kid and he's like, yeah. Or, or my grammar. I don't know that I was a kid, uh, but like he sent me his first paper and I was hooked on scientific papers after that. I didn't even understand what I was reading at the time, uh, but I was absolutely hooked on scientific papers after that. So you're a yeah. different breed. You're a different Mito says fusion is always 15 years away. Um, if, if fusion is a dream man it really is and it, it solves almost all of our energy all of problems. Our problems yeah all, it it, solves it's, our, it's, a, it's a unicorn right it's but a unicorn it, it solves our problems with uh with 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 weight nuclear waste i mean the waste product is helium which we're running out of helium so we need that too um yeah. and and like hydrogen fusion is not the only fusion that could be done as well i'm not as well versed on on other types though so um Hypothetically, if someone had 100% of their net worth and unsellable real estate, would it be advisable that they diversify by investing some of the equity? Um, I, I believe that it, it would be advisable. Uh, it depends on how, and, and this is a this is an odd odd statement. About it. It, it depends on how closely your identity is attached to that piece of property and the uh, the dollar value of that piece of property. As interest rates rise, you may see. And, and if interest rates rise and we see inflation go down right away, um, you're actually going to see a pretty negative impact on the value of your home. Now, if inflation continues to rise or continue to stay relatively high with rising interest rates, then the value of your property will probably rise too. But people forget that property values go down. They do. You know? Well, so my question would be for that one is, what, one, why is it unsellable? Okay, is it because you have an emotional attachment to it or is that there's no market for it, which would be odd. But I would want to know why is it unsellable? And then two, how would you diversify away from it? Would you leverage it then at that point? In which case that answers a whole nother, that ent enters a whole nother. That brings up a whole other question too. If it's right. unsellable, but, how is it leverageable? Then, but exactly. So you have, yeah. but then how would you diversify away from it? If it's unsellable, you need to essentially use it as collateral for something else, in which case you're taking on debt. And that amplifies your risk return, um, both positively and negatively. So uh, that's a whole nother. I would be interested. That would be. A, I'd, I'd have a conversation. I would. I would want to have a conversation to get to, to get around it. Yep. Uh, no. Shoeless Joe from UK says, "Is Ryan no, he's invested from, in crypto?" Florida. He's from Florida, I think. No, that's crispy tacos. Shoeless Joe oh, okay. is from UK. Yeah. Uh, I I do cool. own. Uh, full disclosure, I do own two cryptocurrencies. I own Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, okay. I put, uh, I put, I want to say I put 10,000 into each of them, um, about eight, nine months ago. And that's, oops. It. Yeah. Well, I just, and I, I, I just put it in there because first I'm, I'm not a big fan of crypto in general for a lot of different reasons, but, uh, I, you know, knowing that there is a whole wave of generation that is investing and does believe in these things, uh, I figured that I needed to embrace it as much as possible. So. Um, so I put money into it and I look at it maybe once a month and it's, of course it is down, but I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm holding it, holding it for long-term. Uh, I think I, but the reason I chose those two is because one Bitcoin is the oldest. And I think 
Two, Ethereum has the largest application and platform, uh, so that I, that's the reason why I bought the two. Um, I thought about Solana as well, but I just I didn't want to spend two. I didn't want to spend two to three weeks working on looking at those two. So I bought right. uh, those are the two that I bought, but it has declined, of course. I, I tell people all the time, and they they don't uh, comprehend this when I say this. Uh, I don't actually give a crap about the value of of Bitcoin or Ethereum or Solana or Algorand or whatever else I own. I own a few more. Um, and, and some of those I got by being paid in cryptocurrency, not not for, for various things that I do. Uh, but I don't actually care about the value of those. What I care about is how the technology is changing the way we do business. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of a world of decentralized finance. Um, I, I am I like, I'm a fair, like most people that, that think they're capitalists aren't capitalists. I think, you know, from my business background, I'm a fairly good capitalist. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do see the inequities that that system pro it creates for people who start off at the bottom, which I started off at the freaking bottom. Right. And I got lucky and made my way not to the top, of course, but higher up the ladder. And there's a lot of obstacles standing, a lot of regulatory obstacles, a lot of obstacles, you know, that are standing in the way uh, for people. And I think that blockchain is a way to end that to a degree for a lot of folks. Um, and I, but the thing is, I don't know how that's going to evolve. So I'm far right. more interested in the adoption of blockchain as a technology than I am in the value of, of a Bitcoin as an investment. Uh, remember that Bitcoin is also endlessly, uh, you know, fractionalized as well, uh, Ethereum as well. So the value is, the, the value of a single coin is not going to matter that much in the future because we won't be doing business in like single coins. Right. But the uh, and, and right now you can't tell me that that development on any particular network actually directly translates into tokenomics. Like, how is this going to make this token more value, more right. valuable? It doesn't necessarily do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So what is does Bitcoin have an intrinsic value? I think that it doesn't have any more intrinsic value than the U.S. dollar does. It only has dollar value because everyone thinks because that it does. Believes it does, right? Right. Which is which is which is kind of the issue. Like we we could see it stabilize, and I, I think we will see it stabilize in the next decade or so, uh, as it becomes more and more a part of our, our everyday lives. The big threat to uh, to blockchain technology, not just Bitcoin, but the big threat to blockchain te technology in general, I think is going to be uh, central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. They look like they look like uh, blockchain should look. They feel like you know, cryptocurrency should feel, but they are not. Yeah, centralized banking. Uh, you mean global banking, banking network is is yep. not going to sit back and allow uh, people to uh, to create their own currencies. You know, that's who would have thought. At, at this point, they can't stop it. Um, they cannot stop but they it. Can, at this point. But they can just t take over the market share. They can that's they have to win the market share, which yeah. I think is possible. I think people don't care as much about the trilemma of cryptocurrency like I do. Like I, I care about scalability, I care about security, and I care about decentralization. I think decentralization is the one leg of that trilemma or or stool that the general public does not care about because they don't understand how important it is to the overall endeavor of, of blockchain. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how. Maybe I'm not very good at articulating that position. It doesn't seem like I'm able to convince anyone of that. Um, so, but the, the disruption though has already started. You just don't know it. Uh, and I'm not talking about El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Look at what Algorand is doing in terms of remittances uh, in the Marshall Islands in, in, in other places in the South Pacific and in South America where they're facilitating these payment networks to vastly reduce the cost and the fees of transferring money back and forth. I like Marshall Islands. Marshall Islands is the best example. There are more Marshall Islanders that live off the Marshall Islands than live on the Marshall Islands. They've had this massive immigration going back for almost a century now, and they're constantly sending, sending remittances back to, uh, and they were losing a huge portion of their GDP in, in fees and wire fees. Yeah. And that's all ending now with, uh, with, with Algorand, actually, they're actually cooperating. But I think I think this is what Algorand is doing is cooperating with this with the uh, CDBC, a, a central bank uh, digital currency, which is not what I want to see in terms of government involvement, but it is what I want to see in terms of seeing an actual functioning blockchain. Now, this is a small country, right? 
but so i see i like so i i i see the the both sides of the crypto i'm not a full adopter of it yet uh i'm not a full adopter of it yet but um yeah but you know again i'm uh i've been a certain way for a long period of time and it takes a, a while for me to get there but uh no i do but i do own a couple you know so yeah. it's uh, and, and i own them for very specific reasons um, but do I think that it is, uh, it is a very, very small part of a very, 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 very small part of my overall portfolio. And I'll say one thing, it still, I hesitate to call it an investment. Mm -hmm. It is highly speculative. It's more akin to gambling to me. I don't have that much of my, my wealth tied up into, into, uh, cryptocurrency as well. Even though I'm very excited about the technology, it is very hard to actually invest uh, you know, people dumping in five thousand dollars into one cryptocurrency and then or one token, and then a month later it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. For every one winner doing that, there's a thousand losers. There has to and, be right. yeah, there has to be. That's just that's the way the market works. And the market right now, because there is tons of centralization, it is highly influenced by crypto whales, which people don't realize it is not decentralized and it isn't that different than the current financial situation we have now decentralization has to evolve and um and it's gonna and it's gonna take it's gonna take time to do that it really will anyway this is a subject which i know that you're not that interested in oh well i mean i so but i have uh i have meetings later on today and and luckily luckily and it looks like they're gonna be good conversations because the market finished up talk about an up day uh with something that we needed i think i i think i staved off uh uh balding wow nasdaq's up 3.34 percent yeah, uh, so crazy. So you're happy about that, but we yeah. needed an update, and uh, and I'm glad that you had me on for the rapture. <laughs> the rapture. <laughs> the rapture is coming. I don't want to invest. Yeah, I don't. I'm not going to invest. <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, so I want to thank everyone who tuned in today. I realize there's a lot more going on uh, with uh, in the world right now than than just talking about on Fighting Words Financials uh, channel here. Uh, but I want to thank you guys for tuning in. And I'm going to have Ryan on a little bit more often. We're going to be talking about more investment specific stuff and less about world affairs in the future and how you can be a better investor. If you want to contact Ryan, um, your email address is ryan at truefc.com. Is that correct? Or truefc.net? That is is it truefc.com or .net? .net. Okay. It's truefc.net. And then I'll put that in the description so you guys can find that. Um, like he and I have no business relationship. We're just former coworkers and friends and, uh, we don't even drink together. So that's going to change. That's yeah. Gonna change. I, I definitely need one where there's a, a whiskey involved. I'll tell you All that right, much. There we go. All right. I will see you folks later. Thank you very much for tuning in today.